Have you experienced any substantial sweating or fatigue? Are you feeling any ongoing pain or numbness in your joints? Numbness or pain in your extremities? No, the teenager replied. No. Nausea. Fever. Swelling? No. She was more impatient now. Nope. Nah, no. Ringing in the ears? Simbrosia peered at the interviewing attendant. Now that you mention it, there's a never-ending, migraine-inducing series of inane questions, which may very well cause me to have a psychotic break. The interning physician was young, and Simbrosia could tell he was tired as he scribbled madly on the progress chart. Then he sighed, resigned, and this was his way of dealing with the rebellious young lady's outburst. She tilted her head at him. Her eyes focused, narrowed, and she felt the pulsing between her eyes. The sensation grew in intensity as she felt chills overtake her. A flash of intense pressure. It was a brief instant in time. Perhaps no more than a second if that, but... Simbrosia peered into the young doctor's future. He would have a long life. One of the lucky ones. Even a successful marriage if he got over his shyness. The moment passed. Simbrosia held out her arm for the obligatory blood pressure test and rolled her eyes. After a few more minutes of awkwardness, the tests were complete. The exhausted man stood and thanked her for her time. How much longer do I have to be in here? the teenager demanded. The young man assured her that someone would be in to see her soon, and he turned to leave, obviously frustrated. Before he closed the door, Simbrosia called after him. There's a doctor that rotates evenings in the ER. Got a crush on you. You should ask him out. The young man shook his head at her. Uh, okay? From behind the two-way mirror, the grizzled old sheriff stroked his long gray beard. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm a simpleton, but can you explain this to me one more time? The federal agent rubbed his eyes. This young woman is to be remanded into federal custody under the Homeland Security Act of 2001. Adjunct to the rules of the federal. Federal buttholes of doucheville. The sheriff waved dismissively as he interrupted. Yeah. <laughs> he then spit a wad of tobacco into a nearby waste can. The federal agent returned his glasses. As you know, officer. Sheriff. Little evidence to that effect, the agent muttered. Excuse me? The agent diverted his gaze to the folder on the metal table. A stark overhead lamp brought out the details of the case in glaring terms. Simbrosia Zalik broke into the ATC station. The sheriff's southern drawl was palpable as he demanded, The what now? What's the ATC? Another damn bureau? The agent sighed. It stands for Air Traffic Control Station. Jesus, okay? Damn you backwards buffoon, she broke into the ATC first and threatened all the air traffic controllers. Then, when that didn't work, that's where you found her. The sheriff placed his hands on his hips and spun to stare through the mirror at the girl he assumed couldn't see him back. Right, jumping up and down on the tarmac, screaming like a banshee, saying she wasn't gonna let the plane off the damn ground. The agent joined the sheriff in peering at the suspect, folding his arms. And she said that everyone was going to die on that flight. There was but the faintest of pause when abruptly Simbrosia snapped her head and was staring at the sheriff through the privacy mirror. The sheriff's hair stood on end. If you assholes are going to gossip about me, could you at least get out of psychic earshot? With the sheriff's enthusiastic agreement, the agent escorted Simbrosia out of the interview room, out of the small police station, and out into the crisp, cold air of the mountains. 
northwestern United States, the highlands outside Seattle. It was dusk and chilly. Pine trees overhead hung low with clinging cold dew. On all sides, everything damp. Every breath a fog of steam. Simbrosia watched the condensation trickle into streams on the passenger side window of the agent's sedan as he rambled on. And this appears to be the fifth time you've caused a problem in mass transit. You are a repeat offender, Miss Alec. She groaned, noncommittally. The agent shook his head. You're sixteen, and this appears to have been happening every year since you were. He flipped a page. Eleven. Is that when all this manifested? Simbrosia nodded. I grew up in the poor district of downtown. Seattle? Yep. My mother dropped off the face of the earth and left my father to fend for me. That didn't turn out so well, especially when he began drinking. He was not a violent alcoholic, but he sure as hell wasn't there as far as dads go. I see all that in your file. The agent flipped through yet another thick dossier, one with photos of various scenes that Simbrosia had caused. What I was hoping to get at here is, when was the first time you stopped a disaster? I had just turned eleven. I was out riding my brand new bike. Summer day. All the typical crap kids love. Well, I was going across a railroad crossing and saw a car headed my way. Next thing I know, my forehead is pulsing. There's this pressure, like an angel is pressing its finger in between my eyes. I see the train hit the car, demolish it, destroy it, totally crash the damn thing to smithereens. I still remember the blood and the Guts and gore and the fire and the smell of the heat. Noted. The agent adjusted his glasses, peering at her deeply. And the file says that you shared this information with your friends, but they didn't believe you. Simbrosia nodded. No one believes a smart-ass kid when they say they're psychic, of course. Of course. The sixteen-year-old continued. It didn't happen that day. It happened the next. I was out for a ride. Same old route, and I saw the car coming. This time, I rolled my bike in front of it, you know? To get it to stop? Well, it did, I mean. Those old farts were friggin' piss, but what are you gonna do? I saved their asses, so... Okay... The agent broke it down. There wasn't some equinox or spatial detritus or paranormal occurrences or... It just happened, dude. Simbrosia stared over at him, leering impatient. One day I woke up and I could feel this pressure, this power, this thing in between my eyes. I focus on it and I can sort of control it, but... If you're looking for mutant powers or space aliens, I don't think that's what this is. What have the doctors told you? Eastern mystics think that I have an overactive chakra. Western medics think that I have an overactive pituitary gland. No one knows and no one believes I can see the future. The agent started the car. I do. I believe you. And I believe you can help. The sedan slowly rolled to a stop in the parking lot of the Twin Pines restaurant. Night had fallen and Simbrosia hugged herself as she strode up to the door. The agent opened it for her. The hell? Are we dating now? The agent said nothing. He rolled his eyes. You're way too old for me. Dude, you're like, what, 30? I can still handcuff you to the table. Simbrosia grinned. Kinky. And the agent lost his patience. Get in the diner. 
The teenager held up her hands and adopted an exaggerated frown, as if to say to the other customers, I don't know what this guy's problem is. A waitress, cotton candy haired with thick Coke bottle glasses, eyed them suspiciously as she took out her notepad. What can we get you? The agent placed his identification shield on the table. That's supposed to mean something to me, the waitress asked. The agent shook his head. Just that I need an annotated copy of the receipt for my expense report. The waitress pursed her lips. Whatever. She turned to Sambrosia. You want to eat something, doll? Chili fries. Chocolate shake. The waitress nodded. Girl knows what she wants. How about you? Nothing. The suspicious waitress sighed and walked off. You stopped what you referred to as... The agent glanced through the manila folder. A helicopter disaster several years ago. When you were thirteen? Simbroja nodded. I was on a ferris wheel with my boyfriend. We were at the top of the ride. What do they call it? The azimuth? The pinnacle. The agent corrected. She ignored him. Right, so we were at the top, the azimuth of the ride, when I was looking out over Seattle. So beautiful at night. And the agent nodded, only barely patiently. And I see this big-ass explosion overhead. It felt so real. I could feel the heat of the flame above me. Got scared thinking chunks were going to fall down on top of us. The waitress showed up with a chocolate shake for Simbrosia and nothing for the agent. Simbrosia sipped the brown malt, waiting until the server left before continuing. I was screaming and shaking, squeezing my eyes shut and my boyfriend was yelling like crazy, freaked all the hell out. A brief pause as a young girl looked up at the ceiling. And none of it happened. My boyfriend, of course, thought I was a complete lunatic. And who could blame him? The agent nodded and scribbled down some notes in the folder. I assume you decided to play superhero and save the day here yet again. Simbrosia nodded, missing the patronizing tone. I got online the next morning and figured out where the local helipads were. Tried to remember the name of the chopper I saw explode, but I eventually figured it out. Figured it out? Meaning you called in a bomb threat and the police traced the call and you were taken to juvenile detention. Big smile from the smart-ass young lady now. Good times. When I got older, my grandmother told me that this was an inherited trait. Some of the people in our family, usually the women, could sometimes glimpse the future. A few of the ladies in our tribe could even read minds. That's what Nana used to say. Darpan Rodin is what she called it. I thought for a while it meant the crying mirror or something like that. It's a very old, very mystic, very Sanskrit term. Well, I mean, it was mystical to Grandma, for what it's worth. What it really means is the backward weeping. I didn't know at the time what the hell that meant either. The crying mirror, backward weeping, reverse tears or whatever. It was all the same to me. Old world nonsense and occult superstition. Then I felt it. The first time I stopped the car from getting slammed by the freight train, I felt someone else. Their tears. And then I felt those teardrops flow backward up my cheekbones. Like a special someone slid a rose around my cheek. That was the first time, at least. Lately, it feels like I'm getting licked by a cat. 
cats have nine lives, Simbroja suddenly stated, dreadfully serious. The agent, as per his modus operandi, took it in stride. That is the standard colloquialism, right? Did you know that the two were connected? What two? The backward weeping and a cat having nine lives. This made the agent appear uncomfortable for some reason. Simbroja noted this fact and pressed the issue before he could interrupt. People used to think that cats' nine lives came from the plague days, when a villager would kill a cat to stop the spread of the bubonic epidemic, only to see the cat come back the next day. The agent became impatient. Yes, the cats were just very similar, and from a litter of up to a dozen, I know the villagers were stupid, it wasn't the same cat. Old wives' tale again. Simbroja arched one eyebrow. I can see up to nine possible futures. Up to ninety years into those possible futures. If I so choose. The agent nodded. Precisely why the Bureau is interested in you. But it's not the Bureau that's interested in me. Is it? The secretive agent finally seemed to let his guard down. He sighed a very deep, very heavy sigh as he took off his glasses and placed them gently on the table. The agent slowly placed his hands, palms down, on the table on either side of the manila file folder and began to speak. Before the FBI agent knew it, the surprising 16-year-old Zimbroja had his hand shackled. He stared down, perplexed, at his own handcuffs, which had been neatly placed on his wrists. Obviously, this prompted his, What the hell? We've done this before. Nine times, precisely, Agent Mavro. How do you know my real... Yeah. Zimbroja feigned shock as she nibbled a chili fry. Jagdeed Mavro, I also know you're not really a federal agent. The exposed agent's face became flush with red rage. That's it. He stood, but somehow the girl had tied his shoelaces to the chair, and the man toppled over. This caused gasps and uproars from the other patrons, especially when his gun went sliding across the diner floor. Mavro scrambled, but looked more like a caterpillar than a trained federal operative. Simbroja picked up the gun by the barrel and held it behind her back as if keeping a ball from a dog. There were a couple of shrieks, and the overweight manager came out, befuddled. The hell? Hey, what is happening out here? Oh my god! His hands curled under his chin in terror as he beheld the sixteen-year-old. She turned to face him, handing him the revolver. Please take this and call the damn cops already, you weenie. The manager tentatively took the service pistol, carefully whisking it to the back office. Mavro was able to stand, but as he lunged for Simbroja, several stocky truckers stopped him in his tracks. The teenage psychic smiled and gently slapped Mavro on the side of the face. You wanted me to be your tool? The physical contact caused a psychic connection, and Jagdeed Mavro saw that indeed they had met before, many times. He tried to recruit her into a secret society. That failed. He'd even tried to sacrifice her. That had failed. His group had tried to help him smuggle her into another country for military purposes. That was a bust. Over and over. In some Groundhog Day nightmare. Mavro had tried to beat her, but every time she won. And she just got better at it. Poison her? he just end up in a hospital. Try to brainwash her? He ended up a vegetable. As if this wasn't enough, there was a psychic toll. 
And by the time Simbrosia broke the connection, the man felt like he'd aged several years. Because he had. Reality is but a series of waveforms that collapse when we interact with them. Some of us, some of the lucky, some of the few can feel the nature of reality in that space between their eyes. They feel the pulse, the rhythm, the light of existence. Some of the chosen can weep backward and choose their own destiny. Mavro collapsed from what a prison physician would later refer to as severe physical exhaustion and ablation. Simbrosia smiled and strolled out the door. She was greeted outside by the local sheriff on his way in. Hey, you again, missy? Miss Troublemaker? You don't think you're wandering off, do you? You best stay right there. I got some questions for you. Simbrosia grinned sweetly and nodded. I'll wait right here. The plump, bearded sheriff grunted and threw open the doors of the diner. Now what in the goddamn tarnation Sam Hill and Stirrups is happening in here? Simbrosia shielded her eyes from the sun, which had finally cracked through the turbulent and bruised clouds. She felt the warmth on her face. She felt the tears go sliding up her face in reverse. Shamelessly, Simbrosia unwept. In the distance was a vehicle, drawing her way. The sixteen-year-old psychic viewed a great many possible futures, and she chose one. But in this decision, she had no more power than anyone else on planet Earth. You don't have to know the future to choose it was your the dice destiny. That gave Leslie away. Simbrosia saw the big, gaudy, dorky, yellow, fuzzy dice first. Next, she saw Leslie's Jeep. Then she saw her cousin, Moriki. Everyone calls her Moore, with that crazy smile of hers. It was infectious, as Simbrosia couldn't stop grinning either when she piled into the Jeep. Less and more. Her cousin and her older friend. Simbrosia, contrarian that she was, considered Leslie and Moriki going by less and more to be about the dorkiest freaking crap on all of planet Earth of the universe. Of course, it made less and more, like the moniker, that much better. As Les peeled onto the highway, headed south and taking Simbrosia to safety, the psychic peered into the future. But that's for her to know.